Our next speaker is Dr. Usha Egeri. She will be speaking on uric acid 8. Is it significant to you? Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk, Dr. GVK and the organizing committee. I always think that if I'm given a topic and I have to study for it, then that's a topic that I need to present to the audience because clearly if I have such doubts in my mind, then the audience must also have the same doubts in their mind. And when I was given this topic of uric acid to treat or not to treat, in fact, I remember saying to Dr. GVK, surely the answer is obvious, not to treat. And then I thought, well, let's see. Do we treat or do we not treat? I have no conflicts of interest for this talk. Now, just to start with a quick poll, how many of you have seen on a health check on anything else a uric acid less than so eight or thereabouts in the last three months? Show of hands. <coughs> okay. Not very many. I can't believe that because with these universal labs doing every single test under the world, uh, you know, these days. And out of the people who've seen a uric acid of that kind of a level, how many of you have um, considered prescribing a urate lowering drug? Just for the number, without anything else. So the majority of people who've actually seen a uric acid level under eight would consider prescribing a drug. Can I just ask one or two people why? Was it to lower just the number? How many people did it just to lower a number? Okay, one. How many of you did it for, to prevent gout, let's say? Nobody. How many of you did it because you thought it would give other benefits? Okay, two people. So, see, there is quite a lot of confusion. Out of the people who said that they've seen a uric acid under eight, some people gave it just to correct the number. Since when do we start treating numbers and not patients? Some people gave it maybe to make themselves feel better because I didn't have any hands up for to, lower, to prevent gout. And some people did it for maybe other benefits. What are these other benefits that we are looking at and how evidence-based is this um, other benefits talk? So if you look at the epidemiology, at any given point of time, around a quarter of the patients in whom you measure uric acid will have a level higher than what you consider upper limit of normal. And this is not so strong in women, but goes up with age and is around 5% in postmenopausal women. But if you look at the prevalence of gout, it's only around 6% in men and 2% in women. So considering that 25% of our patients have a high urate level, only around 6% of them go on to develop gout. So to prevent gout, we don't need to treat uric acid. Let's be clear on that. And as it is more prevalent in men, but as I said, with age, the male to female ratio starts to decrease a little bit. <coughs> so the pathological threshold for uric acid is about 6.8, what they define as a threshold over which you might start seeing any kind of complications. But actually, gout only starts developing with a uric acid over nine usually. So again, that gray zone between 6.8 and nine is again a zone where you're not very clear whether you're treating it for preventing gout, for gout or for anything else. And as with all things, uric acid level in the body is determined by a balance between production and excretion. Now there are two pathways for each. Production for people who eat red meat or meat, there is a lot of dietary intake. And for other um, non-meat eating population, the endogenous production is mainly because of cell turnover. Our usual daily body cell turnover. And in conditions where that cell turnover is increased, then you see an increased production of urate. Excretion is through the kidneys and through the GI tract, and anything that involves either of these things can give you a high urate le level. So overproduction accounts for about 10% of hyperuricemia that you see, and under excretion for about 90%. So overproduction, as I said, could be dietary intake and uh, could be through um, increased cell turnover. But under excretion is generally related to drugs, renal impairment, alcohol, or metabolic defects. As I said previously, male and age relate to hyperuricemia, but also remember, as Dr. Uh, Sriram Mahadevan has just pointed out, obesity is a main uh, culprit for a lot of factors, and obesity contributes to hyperuricemia as well. So when you're interpreting hyperuricemia results, it's never just looking at the number. Look at it in the context of your gender, look at it in the context of age, obesity, BMI, look at it in context of what other drugs the patient is taking. And as if this isn't enough, 
we then have a whole load of metabolic disorders that then contribute to these uric acid disturbances. And they don't all go the same way. There's no saying that, okay, if you have diabetes, it increases it. If you have hypertension, it increases it. But then you go on to, for example, hypothyroidism or hyperparathyroidism, you'll actually see a lower urate level. Go on to sarcoidosis, you'll see a lower urate level. Drugs can go either way. <coughs> for example, B12 can increase it and uh, by st cell turnover, but thiazide diuretics will perhaps increase it by interfering with the renal excretion. Pregnancy, we know, uh, lowers uric acid. So there's a quite a lot of interference. And then that brings me to how does this then tie up with this whole uh, diabetes and uh, uric acid level? We know that. Um, this is just a quick uh, overview of uh, kidney filtration of uric acid. And anything that is this highly reabsorbed, like glucose, like protein, like other things, must have a significant role in our uh, metabolic processes. Because when something is this highly conserved, when you have a substrate that is nearly 100% filtered, but then nearly 100% reabsorbed, you know that this is something that is essential to the body. And why is uric acid essential to the body? If you look at the physiological functions of serum uric acid in the body, it is actually one of the major antioxidants in the body. 50 to 70 percent of your antioxidant activity in the body comes from uric acid. And this was an eye opener to me when I started going to, through the literature. So we actually need uric acid to mop up our reactive oxygen species and to mop up all those nitrous oxide and peroxynitrate uh, species. Um, molecules that cause endothelial vascular damage. And I'm going to talk about endothelial function in a little while, but it is also important, uric acid levels at a certain level are important to preserve endothelial function. <coughs> if you look at the uric acid pathway, we know that we have purines and uh, the uh, DNA molecules. You go to hypoxanthine, that is oxidized by xanthine oxidase to xanthine and then to uric acid. So we know that this pathway is essential to produce uric acid, and I've just told you that uric acid is a major antioxidant in our body. But then look at the flip side of it. When hypoxanthine goes to xanthine, you lose superoxide molecules. And those, these superoxide molecules are actually damaging to the tissues. So these are the same molecules that we are trying to protect against. So then you have this conundrum. Is it good? Is it bad? Do we want more uric acid at the cost of more superoxide molecules? Do we want less uric acid? What is the relationship? So a few studies have improved, reported an improvement of endothelial function with xanthine oxidase inhibitors. So at that step where it says XO, that is xanthine oxidase. But then xanthine oxidase per se could redirect your uh, pathway to produce more uh, super anions. So then that will, by blocking xanthine oxidase, you might be reducing the super, um, superoxide ions, but what are you doing with your uric acid? You're reducing your uric acid as well. So is that a good thing or a bad thing? How is it going to affect overall? So again, there are lots of unanswered questions. So one of these papers looked at exactly this. And as with most biological systems, whether you look at glucose, whether you look at A1C, whether you look at cholesterol, whether you look at BMI, there is a J-shaped association. There seems to be a sweet spot, somewhere around the six kind of mark for uric acid. Lower than four, and you have an increase in CVD risk. Higher than eight, you seem to have a CVD risk, but there is a sweet spot in between at which the uric acid is optimal. And when you look at left ventricular hypertrophy, it is again the same, around that sweet spot. Higher than that, you have an increase in hypertrophy. So there does seem to be some kind of an association, but is association causality? and does changing an association change outcomes? Now, the answer to that question was a lot more complicated than I imagined. So if you look at serum uric acid, is it a biomarker? Is it a mediator? Does changing it make any difference to lifestyle and cardiovascular diseases? So when you look through the literature, what ultimately seems to be there is that serum uric acid is considered to be one of the candidates of residual risk. We all know this concept of residual risk. You correct the HP's A1C, you correct the hypertension, you correct the LDL, and there is still a residual cardiovascular risk in these patients. Maybe uric acid is one of these markers that risk contribute to these uh, residual risk. But then it doesn't seem to be so straightforward. Once you add in any drug that modifies the serum uric acid levels, like a diuretic in a cardiac patient, this association seems to disappear. So the picture gets more confusing. So if you look at the role of uric acid in metabolism related to inflammation 
and NASH, for example, and this I found very interesting because these are the kind of things you see with diabetes. We know that diabetes is a pro-inflammatory um, condition, and so what does uric acid do when you have uh, diabetes? You can see that, sorry, do I have a pointer? No, I don't, okay. Top left, the uric acid crystals act directly on inflammatory pathways, but they also act through NADPH oxidase and the mitochondrial um, reactive oxygen species absorption pathways to actually promote interleukin uh, generation, and so it is a pro-inflammatory pathway. So the inflammasome is activated by your uric acid crystals. And then we have this whole xanthine oxidase. So again, ignore the top half of the picture. If you can concentrate on the lower half of the picture, you will see that once you put in xanthine oxidase, oxidative stress, COX, lipid metabolism, ah, thank you. So your lipid metabolism, your oxidative stress pathways, your COX pathways, all of which we know are included in cardiovascular risk, start to slightly improve. But this is when you start inhibiting xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase itself, is actually a risk factor for all of these. So then, what is the relationship between hyperuricemia, endothelial dysfunction, and cardiovascular disease? We looked at the molecular mechanisms. It's been hypothesized, as I said, that uric acid is one of the major antioxidants in humans. So does it protect against oxidative stress in cardiovascular and neural cells? Maybe to an extent. But as I showed you, there is a J-shaped curve. Elevated serum uric acid levels, in contrast, again show a risk for cardiovascular disease. So there is no clear answer, even amongst the molecular mechanisms, as to how it works. Then the question arises, this antioxidant effect, to, how, to what extent is it protective? At what level does it start actually giving you an increased risk? The precise mechanisms of tissue injury remain unclear. And even if uric acid were to play a role in oxidative stress and it mops up reactive oxygen species and um, subsequently impairs nitrous oxide production, the exact mechanisms by which there might be a beneficial role for xanthine oxidase inhibitors is unknown. It could be because they improve the endothelial dysfunction, but remember, it could also be because they impair that one superoxide molecule that comes out. <laughs> it may or may not actually be related to the uric acid levels per se. So when you have a high uric acid and you give a xanthine, um, xanthine oxidase drug, um, inhibitor, the effect of it on a protection may not be because of the uric acid level, but by removing that uh, superoxide molecule. So the conclusion from these various papers was that to date, no large blinded randomized placebo control studies have demonstrated that lowering serum uric acid can prevent or lessen the risk of cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diabetes, or hypertension. Everyone goes on to say future larger studies are required. Now, this was one paper that I thought would make some sense. Look, we treat people for gout, right, all the time. They are getting uric acid uh, lowering drugs. So what if you looked at people with gout and went forward and saw if there was any outcome difference in uh, cardiovascular morbidity in people who are already on uric acid lowering drugs for a different condition, right? You're not doing it for cardiovascular protection. They're being treated for gout. 14,000 people in this study, they were taking uric acid uh, lowering agents to treat gout and there is very limited data available on the treatment of hyperuricemia in asymptomatic patients. And even in patients given uric acid lowering drugs for gout, there was no eventual cardiovascular difference. There was no difference in cardiovascular mortality or morbidity. So if at all we were ever to find, unless somebody funds a trial in hyperuricemic patients and follows them forward for five to 10 to 20 years to look at cardiovascular outcomes, what is the only other setting in which we are likely to see any outcomes? And that is where drugs are already being used to treat hyperuricemia and then follow this group of uh, patients forward and see if it makes any difference. They have high uric acid levels, which ought to work really well for an um, anti-inflammatory um, antioxidant level. And then they're already being given xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which ought to remove the superoxide molecule. So surely this should be a slam dunk kind of answer. No, it still doesn't make any difference to cardiovascular outcomes. <coughs> so in conclusion, over the mean uh, 1.3 year follow-up, there was really no major difference. Now, before I project my conclusion slide, there was one other slide I wanted to put in and uh, forgot. Remember the January publication, there was a meta-analysis of xanthine oxidase inhibitors, which was Feboxistat, looked at in 14,000 patients, and they looked at 
cardiovascular risk. And actually, over a period of years, febroxystat itself causes cardiovascular morbidity. Now, whether this is it's because it's lowering uh, uric acid levels or whether this is to do more with the uh, reactive oxygen species, we don't know. This is just a meta-analysis of uh, several trials. That doesn't give us causation, that doesn't give us association. So right now, to the best of our knowledge, the only place where we've been shown to perhaps start to modify outcomes is in renal disease where there has been maybe some indication of slowing of progression in uh, renal pathology. Because remember, although I didn't go into the renal physiology of urate, hyperuricemia can cause renal problems, but renal problems per se can cause hyperuricemia. This is the only field where it shows some difference. In no other field has it been shown that hyperuricemia or treating hyperuricemia can make a difference to either diabetes, cardiovascular outcomes, or anything else. So that's where I'd like to stop. Thank you very much.